Lecture 32, I call it the middle ground or close encounters of the colonial kind. Uh, a couple of themes to keep in mind here. Uh, we're discussing European imperialism in the New World. Uh, think about the initial contact between these very different peoples, uh, Europeans on the one hand, American Indians on the other. Uh, our setting here is uh, Huronia. You've heard of Lake Huron, uh, one of the Great Lakes. It's the area around uh, Lake Huron. Uh, in colonial times, uh, of course, North America was carved up like a big pizza. Uh, Spain getting sliced, the, uh, the English, the French. So what we're going to talk about here is New France uh, along the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Great Lakes uh, in the 17th century. Let me characterize this middle ground for you. It is a metaphor. It's not a physical place. It's a place that both the Europeans and the Indians will go to psychologically in their minds. Uh, it's a search for compromise and common meaning uh, between the French and the Huronian Indians. Uh, this middle ground is necessary because neither side can gain their goals through force, so they have to compromise. Uh, it's an attempt to reason and to understand one another. Uh, the middle ground is a place of sort of constant improvisation and invention as these two alien peoples try to uh, accommodate one another. Uh, the middle ground occurs at the very outer edge, the periphery of imperialism, where imperial power is, is at its weakest. Uh, that's why we have to compromise and accommodate, negotiate, because we can't force the other side uh, to do as we wish. Uh, by looking at the middle ground, uh, it allows us to examine Indian agency. We talked about African agency when we discussed slavery. Uh, the same thing works here. Quite often the Indians are simply uh, historical figures that Europeans act upon. Um, the middle ground allows us to see that Indians themselves have the will and the capacity to act. Um, Native American voices are often lost in our histories. The middle ground allows us to restore them. Indians aren't simply acted upon. They act against the Europeans or with them. Uh, this is a, an example, this middle ground discussion. It's a good example of what we call cultural history instead of uh, a more traditional uh, Whig history, Whig, W-H-I-G. Let me, uh, let me see if I can draw some distinctions between these two types of history. Uh, cultural history is relatively new. It sort of emerged in the 80s and 90s. Uh, cultural history searches for meaning. Whig history is different. This is a more traditional uh, type of history. Uh, let me characterize it. It's the notion that all history has been preparing for and aiming at the present state of things. Uh, history is written to justify present practices. Uh, Whig historians make assumptions about the direction of history. Example, U.S. history is one of inevitable progress and the expansion of freedom. Uh, with freedom as our starting point, we can argue uh, all sorts of things. Uh, the U.S. invasion of Iraq, for instance, in 03, is justified because the Americans merely want to spread freedom um, to the Arab and uh, Muslim cultures. Another example, uh, well, this desire to spread freedom is a, is a good cover uh, for the imperial project, just as uh, early modern Europeans could claim that their desire to spread Christianity is a good thing. Uh, again, a good cover to take over other people's property. Whig history uh, makes the present seem inevitable. Uh, it discounts contingency, what might have happened. Uh, Whig history follows history backwards and finds road markers along the way pointing to the inevitable. So Whig historians know the outcome and they find uh, markers for that outcome. Cultural history, on the other hand, follows history going forward uh, looking for meaning and agency, contingency along the way. Uh, earlier histories of New France presented Indians as incidental to the story, actors to be uh, pushed aside. 
the Indian uh, demise is presented as inevitable. This lecture, on the other hand, will, uh, will stress or emphasize Indian agency and historical contingency. So let's look at strengths and weaknesses of the two sides, the French and the Huronians. And among the French, there are two groups, uh, the French Jesuits, uh, the Jesuits, of course, are an order of the Catholic Church. Uh, the proper name is the Society of Jesus. Uh, these are very devout, um, uh, well-educated men. Uh, I've heard them described as the Marine Corps of the Catholic Church because they often go in first and do the heavy, dangerous work. Here in New France, the Jesuits are sort of paving the way uh, for French civilization to follow. The, the other group of French that we'll encounter are, of course, French fur traders. And then, of course, we have the Huronian Indians, on the other hand. So let's look at strengths and weaknesses. Uh, Huronian uh, strengths, well, they have a home court advantage, don't they? Uh, they know how to live in this rough country. Uh, they know how to hunt, how to fish, uh, how to take care of themselves, uh, with their collection of herbs and different medicines, natural medicines. The Indians have great self-confidence in their society. Uh, we have a lot of evidence for this, uh, whereby Europeans uh, will often abandon the European settlement and go live with the Indians. Or Europeans might be kidnapped as children and grow up with the Indians and prefer to remain with them. Uh, a lot of Europeans decide that in the Indian way of life is more attractive. Uh, another strength for the Huronians, of course, is that they are polytheistic. Uh, this means they can take this new Christian God and simply include him in an already existing pantheon of gods. Uh, how about some weaknesses for the Huronians? Well, the major weakness is obvious. They have no immunity to European diseases. Uh, consider this case of the, uh, of the shaman, the Indian shaman. Uh, we have euphemisms for this. Uh, uh, medicine man, uh, what's another one, witch doctor. Think about the, uh, the prestige. This is a powerful, highly respected figure in Indian society. Now imagine what happens to him when the Europeans arrive, not only with their deadly diseases, but with this new Christian God. Uh, suddenly the Indians are dying like flies and the shaman uh, has no way of stopping this massive die-off. Uh, what's causing it. Uh, remember, this is the 17th century. There are no germs. There's no bacteria. There are no viruses. Uh, what's causing this massive die-off? Is it God? Is it this new Christian God? Uh, so the shaman's position in Indian society is sort of turned upside down here because he obviously is not as powerful as this new European God, nor does he have any herbs in his little pouch that will fix smallpox. So this has the effect of, uh, of destabilizing and overturning Indian society. Um, other Indian weaknesses, they become dependent upon European trade items. Uh, the Indians do not have metallurgy. Uh, the Europeans do. So simple tools and weapons, anything made of metal, uh, the Indians become dependent upon the Europeans for these things. And relationships built on dependency are quite often uh, uh, tense and uncomfortable. Now let's look at the Jesuits for a moment. Uh, let's look at their strengths first. Uh, the Indians recognize that these Jesuit priests are very courageous uh, men. Uh, they venture off into the, uh, the wilds of North America with these Indians by themselves quite often. Uh, and that takes a lot of guts to leave your society behind. Uh, the Indians recognize that these Jesuit priests obviously have some connection to this new, powerful, and perhaps deadly Christian God. Uh, the Jesuit priests don't chase Indian women. Uh, they've taken a vow of chastity. Uh, they've taken a vow of poverty. Uh, this has the effect of rejecting the material world so that their entire lives can be spent uh, uh, in devotion of God. Uh, the Jesuits aren't interested in claiming Indian lands, uh, unlike other Europeans. Uh, the Jesuits are illiterate people, unlike the Indians who, are, 
whose culture is based on oral tradition. Uh, this will give the Europeans a great advantage in this colonial encounter. And of course the Jesuits have access to technology that the Indians uh, do not. What about Jesuit weaknesses? Well, their appearance is a weakness. They, have, um, they wear long black robes and wide brim black hats. You can look at an image of them here and you can see this is not good hiking gear. Uh, the Jesuits look ridiculous stumbling and falling as they wear these, uh, their long black robes. In fact, the Indians quite often refer to the Jesuits as black robes. Uh, the Jesuits, like most European men, also wear beards. Uh, you'll notice the Indians do not have beards. In fact, the Indians regard facial hair as repugnant. Uh, to them, it looks like uh, nothing more than a food catcher or maybe a place for insects to nest, and uh, they regard it as most unattractive. The, uh, the Jesuits also suffer from a lack of reciprocity. Uh, a nice verb here, to reciprocate, means to give back to. So you take me to dinner, I reciprocate by taking you to dinner. Uh, Indian society is based on this notion of reciprocity. And the Jesuit priests have nothing to give back. So the Indians provide health care, shelter, food, protection. And what do the Jesuits provide the Indians? Nothing. They have no material possessions. They've taken a vow of poverty. Um, the only thing they really have to offer is Christian salvation, something for which the Indians are, are dubious at best. So the lack of reciprocity uh, creates tension. Uh, another weakness for the Jesuits, uh, they sort of endlessly uh, criticize the Indians for their sex lives. Uh, Indian maidens are encouraged to experiment sexually before marriage. Uh, once married, they're expected to be faithful. Now, what does this look like to the Jesuit priest? Well, it looks like promiscuity, doesn't it? Or, to be uh, more blunt, it looks like sin. So the Jesuits are sort of constantly admonishing the Indians for their sex lives, and you can imagine how tiresome uh, this could be. Uh, the Indians basically have the sort of idea of, uh, uh, why are you criticizing us? Uh, here you are trying to make up the rules, and you don't even play the game. And there's one other weakness here that I'm going to mention. It seems uh, maybe a bit trivial, but I don't think it is. In these northern latitudes, you have a brief summer. And in this brief summer, billions upon billions of mosquitoes and black flies emerge from the bogs and the lakes. And these, uh, these insects are voracious, uh, very aggressive, and uh, can eat you alive. Now the Indians uh, have found a remedy for this. They take animal fat, melt it down, and smear it all over their bodies. This creates a protective sheen that the mosquitoes can't bite through. Well, the European priests, the Jesuits, regard this as disgusting, and they do not want to smear animal fat all over them. Um, so they get bitten by these insects. Again, uh, this is not trivial when you think about it. In 17th century New France, there are no med first. There are no hospitals. There's no penicillin. Uh, you get multiple bites and then you scratch and then they get infected and you can be in serious trouble. Now, I wanna talk about four uh, examples where the middle ground comes into play. First is trade. Uh, the two sides do not um, agree on the, how to assign value to things. Uh, for instance, if I'm trading with my Indian partner, I'm a, I'm a French fur trader, and I offer him five crates of European manufactured goods for a pallet of beaver pelts, and we do this in January when it's cold. We make the trade, the Indian's happy, I'm happy. Now, move forward six months to August, it's hot. I meet my Indian trading partner. Instead of five crates, I offer him one crate of European manufactured goods for his pallet of beaver pelts. And the Indian says, why are you trying to cheat me? I thought we had a relationship. I thought we were friends. And now you're trying to take advantage of me. And I say, no, no, I'm not. It's just that it's August and there's not the demand back in Paris uh, for beaver pelts as there is in January when it's cold. 
And uh, you can see that this is a fundamental difference in how to assign value. Uh, the French, like we are today, we allow the market more or less to assign value, supply and demand. Uh, you can see this in your everyday life. The price of gas today is not the same as it was yesterday. Uh, the Indians don't look at it this way. The Indians look at their beaver pelts as having an inherent value that does not change, uh, regardless if it's January or August. So you can see there's a fundamental problem here with assigning uh, value. The consequence of this is that Indians will often, often feel like they're being cheated and they will break into French stores and take stuff um, and as compensation. Of course, for the French, this looks like theft. So in time, the French will come around to the idea of simply leaving out uh, a certain percentage of stuff for the Indians to take. They're going to take it anyway. We might as well give it to them. That keeps us from fighting with each other and ruining our trade relationship. So the, the French begin to sort of leave gratuities or tips for the Indians. Uh, justice is another area where the two sides uh, don't see eye to eye. Uh, the French, like um, Americans today, sort of rely on um, nameless, faceless bureaucracy to take care of justice. Uh, the Indians think this is a little crazy. Uh, an Indian is killed and the Indians want to be a part of that investigation, part of that incarceration and punishment. And of course in the West uh, we like the idea of justice being blind and an impartial bureaucracy takes care of justice for us. In time the Europeans uh, will see the validity at least of the Indian argument and use them in investigation of crime. And uh, you can see the middle ground working here a bit. Uh, just as in trade, the two sides are trying to understand one another, trying to accommodate each other. Uh, I mentioned sex a moment ago. I'll just say briefly here that the, uh, the French, uh, not the Jesuit priest, but other French, are very good at marrying Indians and creating French and Indian families. Uh, this has a, the effect of mitigating some of this tension uh, caused by the constant criticism of Indian sex lives. And then finally, in war, the two sides don't fight the same, do they? Uh, Europeans with, uh, with firearms uh, gather large groups of men and, um, under the command of officers and fire volleys of metal at the enemy across a field. Uh, Europeans meet in a big open field, we call it a battlefield. The Indians regard this as ridiculous. To stand out in the open and allow a thousand men to shoot at you uh, seems crazy. Uh, the Indian says, I'll kill you where I find you. I'll cut your throat at night while you're sleeping. I'll burn your house down, poison your well, kidnap your children. Uh, but I'm not going to stand in an open field and let you shoot at me. Um, we can see the middle ground operating here a bit as the Indians begin to appreciate European uh, command and control, uh, supply, and, and things like this. And at the same time, you can see the Europeans learn uh, from the Indians, ambush, deceit, trickery. Uh, if you think about the American Revolution, think about how the Americans often fought the British, uh, Indian style. So you can see the middle ground at work here. Uh, let's draw some conclusions. This middle ground allows us a glimpse into these initial colonial encounters. It allows us to see contingency instead of uh, inevitability. It allows us to hear and see Indians' agency in action. And it allows us to see European imperialism at the very periphery, where it's weakest and where instead of imposing their will, the Europeans have to compromise and accommodate the Indians in the middle ground. Thank you.